not just the war on drugs, but to end this history and cycle of caste in America. Thank you so much for having me tonight. Thank you. Um, good evening, and, and I'm going to try to move through my initial comments quickly so I can get the questioning started, and you all can then get into the question and answers with us. Um, again, I'm Dr. Rhonda Williams. I'm the founder and director of the Social Justice Institute at Case Western Reserve University. And before we actually get started on initiating some dialogue with Professor Alexander, what we want you all to do is if you have a question, please raise your hand. There will be people in the audience who will come around to you, an usher from Olivet or a member of the Distinguished Gentleman of Spoken Word, who will give you an index card. Um, and on that index card, please write your question. Please write it legibly so we can read it and pass your card to the end of the row, and it will be collected. Um, while we begin our conversation and the cards are collected, then I'll look down to the front row here and just a couple questions as, as the questions are being collected so that we can then begin to get your questions into the mix of the conversation that Professor Alexander and I will have. So with that, let me move over here and get some questions started. And please write your questions down. Professor Alexander, a very provocative conversation and dialogue that you just had with us. And one of the places I actually want to start is a place where you kind of left us um, in talking about caste and mm -hmm. talking about questions of being worthy. Um, in your discussion of the racial caste system in the chapter entitled The New Jim Crow, you actually quote Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Um, and he says this in the chapter. He says, nothing in all the world is more dangerous than sincere ignorance and conscious stupidity, end mm -hmm. quote. Mm -hmm. And this reminds me of a, of a quote by James Baldwin, actually, in which James, ba James Baldwin actually says, it is certain that ignorance allied with power is the most ferocious enemy mm -hmm. justice can have. Mm -hmm. Right, so I'm a historian. I'm listening mm -hmm. to you talk about caste. And I really believe that history is absolutely, absolutely indispensable. I argue with people about this all the time. We just want to talk about the contemporary moment and they don't want to talk about history. But it's absolutely indispensable to building justice. Mm -hmm. So can you talk to us about why it is you found it critically important to start your book even with a brief discussion of history? Mm -hmm. um, because you could have started so many places, right? And, and you talked about the Underground Railroad as a reference. You talked about reparations. You, in your book, you talk about slavery and old Jim Crow. There's so many people who don't even know what those terms are to even yes. get to the new Jim Crow. Can you tell us why you started there? I think it is, just as you said, mm -hmm. so critically important for people to understand how this present moment, how our system of mass incarceration is linked to the history of slavery, to Jim Crow. And there is a direct line that runs from slavery to convict leasing to Jim Crow and to now to mass incarceration. Um, in the first chapter of the book, I describe the cyclical rebirth of caste in America. Since our nation's founding, African Americans have repeatedly been controlled through systems like slavery and Jim Crow, which appear to die, but then are reborn in new form, tailored to the needs and constraints of the time. For example, following the end of slavery, a new system was born to replace slavery, known as convict leasing. Um, you know, many people don't realize that you know, after the Civil War, African American men were arrested in mass. It was our nation's first prison boom. They were arrested for extremely minor crimes like loitering and vagrancy. Arrested, sent to prison, and then leased to plantations. Sometimes the very plantations they had been freed from or their parents had been freed from. Leased to plantations, and the idea was that they were supposed to earn their freedom, but the catch was they could never earn enough to pay back the cost of their clothing, food, shelter, you know, to the plantation owner's satisfaction. So they were effectively re-enslaved, sometimes for the rest of their lives. Um, Douglas Blackman wrote a wonderful book about this called Slavery by Another Name, about the rebirth of slavery in the South following the Civil War. Um, and I think it's important for people to see the ways in which these divide and conquer kind of politics 
have been used over and over again. Um, you know, the reason we had an all-black system of slavery was traceable in large part by the efforts of plantation owners to pit white indentured servants against black folks who were becoming increasingly labeled as slaves and to make poor whites feel that they had some stake right. in the system. Um, and the same was true with the birth of Jim Crow. Um, the people who championed the Jim Crow laws from the beginning were politicians that were trying to decimate a growing interracial alliance between poor people of color and the populist movement. Mm -hmm. And so you see over and over again how these same divide and conquer politics, trying to pit poor people, working people against one another, um, birth these new systems of racial and social control. And if we don't connect those dots and understand those patterns, we will continue um, to fall prey to these patterns over and over again. And one of the, the things that you just mentioned in terms of the the plantation system being leased to back to plantations. With another way was they were actually leased to urban into urban industrial areas yeah. as well. I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about that because I think it's it's you see the the connected dots even more so to the prison industrial complex right now. The idea that they were leased to places, cities, uh, businesses that actually helped to build the infrastructure of the nation. Yes, right? Douglas Blackman's book again, Slavery by Another Name, excellent in talking about precisely you know, that phenomenon that, you know, it were, it was um, prisoners who were effectively re-enslaved that helped to build railroads, helped to build the city of Atlanta, that mm -hmm. helped um, to actually lay the foundation for, you know, um, our industrialized democracy. Mm -hmm. um, and we see prisoners being used in a similar fashion today. Mm -hmm. um, you know, Many corporations have found that they don't necessarily have to ship jobs overseas in order to exploit cheap labor, that they can actually use prison labor. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the 13th Amendment, which abolished slavery, provides an exception for right. people in prison. Um, and so when people say, well, slavery has been abolished, right. I say, no. That's right. No, it hasn't. Mm -hmm. um, there's a loophole. Um, you know, and I think it's very interesting that our Constitution itself sort of foreshadows mm -hmm. what future caste systems right. may look like. Before you tell them what the loophole is, is, does most people in the audience know that there's a loophole to the 13th Amendment? Okay. Tell them, okay. Yeah, well, the loophole is that, you know, uh, slavery is abolished except for forced labor in prison. Right. Um, and, you know, there's a loophole, too, in the 15th Amendment, mm -hmm. which you know, um, prohibits discrimination on the basis of race in voting, but there's a loophole, mm -hmm. except for those duly convicted of crime. Right. So, you know, there's a way in which the Constitution itself sort of foreshadows, well, here's the way you can get around, <laughs> um, you know, the, the, the rights that are guaranteed in the Constitution and recreate a second class type status um, for people without violating the express terms of the Constitution itself. And while many people in the audience may know at this point what we mean by Jim Crow, before we can get to the new Jim Crow, we gotta know what the old Jim Crow is. Can you just articulate very clearly what the old Jim Crow is or was? Well, the old Jim Crow was a system of rules, laws, policies, and practices mm -hmm. that enforced legal segregation in schools, buses, Railroad train stations um, had separate water fountains. It was a system of legal discrimination in employment, housing, voting, jury system, in virtually every walk of life. Mm -hmm. And today we see the end of kind of formal Jim Crow kinds of laws, laws that authorize race discrimination explicitly. Um, but what we see is this resurgence of laws that have a Jim Crow effect. Mm -hmm. And um, in many respects, this isn't so new. It's still kind of old because, you know, many Jim Crow practices, um, even back, you know, in the 1940s, were officially colorblind. Mm -hmm. um, poll taxes and literacy tests, which operated to keep black folks from the polls, were officially colorblind. Um, they didn't violate the 15th Amendment ban on race discrimination and voting because they were officially colorblind. But those 
poll taxes and literacy tests were enforced in such a racially discriminatory manner that in effect, they disenfranchised African Americans throughout the South. Well, today, our drug laws are officially colorblind, but they're being enforced in such a grossly discriminatory manner mm -hmm. that they are operating to create a new caste-like system, even though on the surface um, they seem perfectly colorblind. Right. I want to jump to the last chapter of your book, and then I want to come to the come down to the front row and get some questions from the audience. Uh, in the last chapter of your book, the fire this time um, is a reference to James Baldwin's uh, 1963 book, The Fire Next Time. Mm -hmm. Um, and in that last chapter that you write, you raise the issue of how difficult it is to seem to get some people to actually motivate, to engage in, to, do, to actually build a social movement, which is where you, where you took us towards the end. And I wonder if we could talk about that just a little bit more, and if we could talk about it in the context of what this means with regard to perceptions we might hold of people in our own communities, mm -hmm. if we might talk about this in the context of class politics, mm -hmm. um, in any other ways that you think um, it is prohibited, quote unquote, in our community for us to feel less compelled to actually engage in a struggle for those who we consider the least among us and who are the least among us. Yes, yes. Well, you know, part of the reason that there hasn't been much of a struggle or pushback mm -hmm. has been, you know, that we've accepted these myths, but mm -hmm. that's not the only reason. Mm -hmm. um, it's also the case that civil rights organizations that knew what was going down mm -hmm. remained quiet. And one of the reasons that many civil rights groups, racial justice advocates remain quiet is because throughout our nation's history, racial justice advocates have always tried to distance themselves from criminals. Mm -hmm. um, it has been a core strategy of racial justice movements since the day of slavery through Jim Crow, to try to identify those African Americans who defy racial stereotypes, mm -hmm. who are of great moral virtue, and hold them up as examples of everything that is wrong with the prevailing caste system. Mm -hmm. And so you have Rosa Parks, who is the epitome of virtue and who becomes the face of the civil rights movement. Versus Claudette Colvin. Exactly, mm -hmm. versus Claudette Colvin. You know, and I talk a little bit about the book that there were a couple of other people who were considered as named plaintiffs to challenge the segregation on Montgomery buses that civil rights advocates refused to represent. And one of them was turned away because she was pregnant, a young woman who was unmarried and who was pregnant, and they felt, no, we cannot possibly have as a named plaintiff, a woman who's unmarried and pregnant. We don't want white America to mm -hmm. be viewing us that way. And another woman had a father who was an alcoholic, and mm -hmm. even that was enough to disqualify her from being a named plaintiff. So the strategy has always been to identify those black folks who defy these racial stereotypes, the good black people, the respectable blacks, mm -hmm. people who white America will sympathize with and respect and identify, and that strategy does not work in challenging mass incarceration mm -hmm. when the MO, the modus operandi of this caste system is criminalizing. So you cannot challenge this caste system meaningfully without inspiring some actual care and concern for those who've been labeled criminals. So this strategy of distancing ourselves from those who've done wrong, from the people who are not perfect, who've made mistakes, mm -hmm. um, won't work this time around. Mm -hmm. And um, I think one of the reasons civil rights organizations have been so slow um, is because they haven't been eager to shine a light on those who are struggling with drug addiction in our community and to make them the face um, of the new movement. Mm -hmm. uh, but there's no way around it. Mm -hmm. With this movement and challenging this caste system, we are actually going to have to do what has been unthinkable and we're actually gonna have to care about each and every one of us, mm -hmm. no matter who we are or what we've done. Mm 
we have an audience question? Yes. Um, the first question we have is, how can state laws be changed with some sense of urgency with the heavy influence of ALEC and many uh, states such as Ohio? Mm -hmm. And then we have another question dealing with education, um, the parallels between mass incarceration and discipline in schools and the overrepresentation of black males. Could you speak to the similarities uh, and common causes of mass incarceration and the struggles of black males in education? Yes, um, both are great questions. You know, the challenges in terms of trying to lobby successfully and get legislators to do the right thing, given the power of um, lobbying organizations like ALEC, given in some states the power of the prison lobby, given um, the lobbying that is done by private prison companies, um, you know, in many respects you look at it and say, well, how could we possibly prevail? Um, given the forces that are arrayed against us. Um, but I think that the reality is that we're going to have to do it the old-fashioned way. We're going to have to be willing to organize people, take the streets, tell huh. the truth in ways that shift public consciousness and create a new moral consensus so that just as today, no matter what party you belong to, you're offended someone calls you a racist, huh. right? There was a time when that wasn't the case. There was a time when right. people were proud to be racist, proud to support Jim Crow segregation. Mm -hmm. Say, you know, se segregation forever, now and forever, and that, they were proud to say that. But a new moral consensus was created that made it unthinkable that you would say that out loud. I think we have to create a new moral consensus where politicians would be ashamed ashamed to say, I want to lock somebody up for 20 years getting caught with a small amount of drugs. That people would be ashamed of saying, oh, it's fine to discriminate against people for the rest of their lives for you know, a mistake they made when they were 19. Hmm. That would be shameful that you have a new moral consensus and know we actually care enough about those people that we dare, we dare suggest that kind of thing. You have an understanding that, no, everybody gets another chance, has an opportunity to earn their way back into the community. But that's a common understanding. And I think it's actually going to require us to get loud, <laughs> to actually be more confrontational in our approach. And I don't mean hostile, but I mean being willing to tell the kinds of truths that will inspire some pushback. We're going to have to have a public argument about this. This isn't going to be something that happens behind closed doors by talking to the, the right person on the legislator's staff and getting them to see the light. No, we're going to actually have to build a new consensus. And it's going to require taking some risks. Mm -hmm. and it's going to require shaking things up. I talked to um, Susan Burton, the woman I was talking about in my remarks not long ago, who called me and said, you know, those of us who are organizing, formerly incarcerated people, we have an idea. Mm. We have an idea of something that we're considering. I want you to tell me whether you think it would work. I said, well, what, well, what is it? What do you have in mind? And she said, well, we're thinking about organizing people throughout California to refuse the plea deal, to refuse to take the plea. Mm. Now, Many of you may, may not be aware that overwhelmingly people take the plea. Almost nobody goes to trial. Trials happen on TV, on Law and Order. Right, right. In real life, people take the plea. In federal courts, about 98% of all cases plea out. 98%. Extremely high rates in state courts as well. Now, why do all these people plea out? Are they all guilty and just anxious to, you know, relieve their conscience and, you know, take whatever punishment is coming to them? No. There's many, many innocent people who plea out as well. Why do so many people plea? Well, the reason so many people plea is that the U.S. Supreme Court has ruled that it is perfectly legal to threaten someone with decades behind bars or even life imprisonment if they dare take their case to trial. Mm -hmm. In a case... This was decided back in the late 70s, a case involving someone who stole, no, it was a case actually involved a bad check in the amount of about $68. Mm. 
The man wanted to fight the charges, and the prosecutor said, no, if you fight these charges, if you take this case to trial, we're going to seek a sentence of life in prison. Mm -hmm. And the man said, well, hmm. I think that's unconstitutional. You can't threaten me. I say I want to take my case to trial. He took this case all the way up to the Supreme Court and said, no. The Supreme Court said, no. It's, it doesn't violate Sixth Amendment right to trial. The prosecutor tells you they're going to sentence you to life imprisonment if you... He took his case to trial and lost. Mm -hmm. Life imprisonment. The U.S. Supreme Court has also ruled that it doesn't violate the Eighth Amendment to sentence first-time drug offenders to life in prison. So when a prosecutor says to you, you take this deal we're offering you, or else, mm -hmm. or else, if you roll the dice in front of the jury and lose, you're going to spend decades behind bars, maybe even life in prison. They're not bluffing. They're not bluffing. Well, Susan said, well, what happens if we organize hundreds, thousands of people to refuse to play, take the deal? Couldn't we shut this whole thing down overnight? And I said, well, yeah, you could. There are not enough judges, not enough courtrooms, not enough jail cells. There are not enough capacity to handle the tsunami of litigation that would occur. If all those people who've been playing out suddenly said, I want my day in court. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, the problem is, is that if you pursue this strategy, mm -hmm. it'll work. It'll shut the system down. But some people will be risking That's their right. lives. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Some people will get life in prison when they could have gotten felony probation. Some people will get life in prison when they could have gotten just five, ten years. Some people will be punished severely for this action. And I said, do you really feel like you can ask people to engage in that kind of protest? And she said, well, you know, we've been talking about it. And what we've come to realize is that reasoned argument doesn't seem to work. So maybe, just maybe, some of us are going to have to be willing to risk our lives. Now. I'm not saying that's a strategy folks should pursue. What I am saying is that if we get serious about trying to challenge the system, we're going to have to be thinking about ways to challenge it in ways that force a conversation that to date we've been content not to have. Is this, is this what you mean by tinkering is for mechanics and not for racial justice advocates? Yes. Can you say that in your book? Yes. Um, you know, there are a lot of really well-meaning, well-intentioned advocates who are working themselves silly, tinkering with this machine. And I was one of them. And I'm not saying that we abandon all reform efforts. No, quite to the contrary. You know, we actually have to engage in reform efforts. The question isn't whether we do reform work. The question is how how we do it. So for example, if we're engaging in advocacy, media advocacy or litigation or organizing to challenge the box on employment applications asking, have you ever been convicted of a felony? If we're seeking ban the box initiatives and they've been successful now in a number of cities around the country, if we're doing that work, we have to make clear in everything that we say and everything that we do that we're not just after this. Mm -hmm. That's not the whole problem. It's one reflection, one manifestation of a larger system of discrimination and exclusion that is keeping so many of our people locked up and locked out. But unfortunately, so many advocates today are so focused on trying to get that one win, they don't want to say anything that might stir up the opposition. And so instead of saying, I want to ban the box on employment applications because I want to end all forms of legal discrimination against people released from prison, some advocates will say, oh, well, here's all of the cost-benefit analysis of why 
this particular policy change is in the collective interest of all. You can give the cost-benefit argument, but you've also got to be willing to tell the whole truth about the work that we're up to. You know, during the Jim Crow days, it was so obvious what the caste system was. You saw the whites-only signs, you know, people were forced to sit on the back of the bus. You didn't have to spell it out for anyone. When the Montgomery bus boycott went down, everybody knew they weren't just challenging bus segregation, but they were challenging the system of segregation as a whole. But today, we have to spell it out. You have to make it visible. You have to say, I'm not just after tinkering with this piece of the machine. I want to change this piece, particular policy, but what I'm really after here is dismantling this larger system. And what I really want from you is not just to ban this box, but I want you to actually care about the people who are applying for those jobs. And that, to me, is the difference between tinkering with the machine and building a movement a movement that sees all these policy reforms as interconnected. A movement that is calling out America for what it has done. A movement that is seeking to end not just these individual piecemeal policies, but the entire system as a whole. And on that note, could you speak to the question about the similarities and the differences between discipline in the schools and, yes. and, and the, the prison industrial complex, and then we'll go to another question. From the yes, audience. yes. Well, you know, we really do have a you know, school to prison pipeline today, and you know, many of these harsh school discipline policies that are forcing so many of our young people out of school and onto the streets, these zero tolerance policies, you know where the zero tolerance language came from? Drug enforcement agency manuals. The zero tolerance rhetoric was born in the war on drugs. That's where the zero tolerance phrase, that rhetoric, came from. And somehow, that war rhetoric has now infiltrated our school systems and is considered education policy. So these zero tolerance form, these zero tolerance policies it began having zero tolerance for drugs, zero tolerance for drug offenders. Well, now we have zero tolerance for our youth. And if you talk back to your teacher, if you get into a fist fight on campus, rather than having a trip to the principal's office, mm -hmm. rather than having your mom called, instead the police are called for you. Mm -hmm. And you're taken away in handcuffs. So in this way, our system of mass incarceration, I think, is best understood as not just a system that controls those who are literally behind bars in prisons. It's a system that controls all those who are on probation, all those who are on parole. And it's a system that seeks control, even of our young people, before they've even managed to truly commit a crime. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We have another question from the audience. Can we talk about a racial caste system without talking about capitalism? Right. Isn't the type of movement you are talking about an anti-capitalist movement? Mm -hmm. That's a good question. Mm -hmm. Now let me say this. I think that the kind of hyper-global capitalism that we've seen in recent decades has a lot to do with the birth of mass incarceration. Um, there's a wonderful book that I recommend called When Work Disappears mm. by William Julius Wilson. And I don't agree with everything William Julius Wilson has to say. Mm -hmm. But what he has done well mm. is document how the disappearance of work in urban areas, the sudden and complete vanishing of work in urban areas, is linked to global capitalism, as companies take their factories and move them overseas in the constant quest for cheaper labor that can be exploited. And, you know, back in the 1970s, the late 60s even, 
and into the 70s, he points out that in urban areas in the north, most black men held some kind of industrial work. They had factory jobs, jobs that you didn't even need necessarily a high school diploma, and you could earn a good living. Not, you wouldn't be rich, but you could support yourself and a family. Well, those jobs vanished in a very short period of time, disappeared. Almost overnight, hundreds of thousands of black men were suddenly jobless, trapped in these segregated inner city communities. Through no fault of their own, work disappeared. And we could have responded to this crisis with economic stimulus packages, bailout programs, we could have invested in education in our poorest communities, job training to help young people make the rough transition from an industrial economy to more of a service-based economy. But no. Instead, we ended the war on poverty and declared the war on drugs. Suddenly, you had hundreds of thousands of black and brown people who were suddenly unnecessary to the functioning of the US economy no longer needed to pick cotton in the fields, no longer needed to labor in factories, suddenly black men found themselves disposable, unnecessary to the functioning of the US economy. And a war was declared. They were rounded up, locked up, and locked into a second class status. And when I talk about the need for a human rights movement, a movement that recognizes the basic human rights to work, the basic human rights to education, the basic human rights to housing, to food. I am talking about a movement that will challenge the kind of, the model of capitalism that we've seen today. It's a movement that will guarantee to each and every one of us, it doesn't matter who you are, as a human being, we can organize ourselves, as a society, we can organize ourselves to ensure that you have education, that you have a roof over your head. You're not guaranteed, each and every one of us isn't guaranteed to be rich, but we're guaranteed to be treated with dignity. Guaranteed basic civil and human rights that apply to each and every one of us. Guaranteed basic opportunity, a fair chance. So yes, I think that there is much about the current model of capitalism that has got to go. But I believe in entrepreneurship. I believe in people being able to use their creativity and their contributions to make money and earn a good living, to be rewarded for creative ideas, for innovation. But I don't think we do that. I don't think we do that well and with justice and with genuine care and concern when we lock some people out, lock them up, lock them out, and say that, well, yeah, you could make it if you tried harder. So you think, and that's what this model of capitalism says. Mm -hmm. So do you think a, a solution, I, I want to probe on the question just a little bit and then go back to the audience, so, uh, audience question. So you, you think there can be a solution to the mass cultural state within a capitalist ethos in the capitalist economy? It just has to be a new kind of capitalism? Or you do you have what? to get rid of a system of capitalism, which some argue actually has built into it the disposability of people already? That people, you need a disposable class of people, so you have to keep reproducing that class in order for capitalism to work, so. I'll tell you this. I really, I personally resist being forced to embrace any of the isms. So you say, do you support capitalism? Do you support socialism? Do you support communism? I say, what I support is justice. I am for basic human rights. You can call it whatever you want. I support a system that will ensure that everybody has quality education, that everybody has access to health care, that everybody has a roof over their head, everybody actually has the right to work, and to earn a living that will support themselves and their family. You can call it whatever you want. Call it pickles. Call it whatever you want. 
I believe that is the economic system that we should create. And, um, you know, I think that there's aspects of capitalism that are healthy and can be productive for individuals and for our society as a whole. I think there's aspects of socialism that are very healthy and necessary for a society that honors the dignity and humanity of every human being. And so I resist being forced to say, I'm a capitalist or I'm a socialist. I say, no, I am a human being who supports justice and the dignity of all people. Uh, Professor Alexander, this is the last question of the evening, the last question of the evening. The UN has a law that addresses it being illegal to practice racial profiling, but the United States did not sign an agreement. Please speak to that. I'm sorry, the United States didn't sign the agreement to what? To uh, ban racial profiling. Mm. Oh, you mean there was a law.